Support for this podcast is brought to you by the Wyoming Humanities. We take a closer look at our human experiences and use stories to explore culture, history, and contemporary issues. You can find us on thinkwhy.org. And I wrote about that for Wyofile, a couple articles. It led to some other stories that uh, public radio did, and I thought that was kind of the end of it. But then people started coming to me. Hello, I'm Emmy DeGrappa. This is What's Your Why? Each week we bring you stories asking our guests the question why. We learn about their passion, why they do what they do, why should we care, and what can we learn? What better place to explore the human landscape than from the state known for its incredible landscapes, Wyoming? And what better organization than Wyoming Humanities? Serving our state for over 45 years, we share stories, ideas, and wisdom about the human experience. Welcome to What's Your Why? Today we are talking to Jeff Lockwood. Jeff is a University of Wyoming professor and author of a recent book, Behind the Carbon Curtain. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I was reading just an excerpt out of your book, and it says that Behind the Carbon Curtain is an exploration of how corporate wealth and power are being used to censor the free expression of ideas in America. So before we start into that, just tell us your why. What was your passion behind putting this information out there? It wasn't a book that I sort of had planned to write. It's a story that came to me, and it really came to me on the campus of the University of Wyoming with a particular sculpture called Carbon Sink by a British land artist, generated a pretty deplorable act of censorship on the part of the university and legislative and corporate pressure. The artwork was removed from campus and destroyed. And I wrote about that for Wyofile, a couple articles. It led to some other stories that uh, public radio did, and I thought that was kind of the end of it. But then people started coming to me. I was getting emails and phone calls from people. Did you hear what, it, you know, what happened in Rollins? Did you hear this story up in Casper? And so I was drawn into these stories and, and came to the conclusion that this silent scene is more systemic, more widespread across Wyoming and probably across the country than I had initially suspected. And so give us, in layman's terms, because it's such a huge subject, how does corporate wealth censor people? How is that being used in the energy industry? What's your explanation? I mean, there's various forms of it, and we've seen it manifest in terms of of science, the things that scientists can and cannot say. Sometimes it's manifest in terms of what gets funded or what's not funded or whose grant gets funded or whose grant gets cut. It can happen in the arts as well, which art pieces are selected in The first case I talked about, which art pieces are destroyed. And of course, in education, what can be taught in the classroom, what we're going to fund to be taught in the classroom. And so it shows itself in many ways. Oftentimes, corporate influence is not direct, but it's mediated through those who have political power to make decisions about funding, to make decisions about education. So it can often be a kind of a complex task to trace from action to outcome. And so it's, it's difficult. And probably the most insidious form is when people begin to self-censor. They choose not to make that art piece. They choose not to conduct that scientific study. They choose not to teach that particular topic because they fear or they anticipate too much trouble. And that's when things get very dangerous in terms of a society, when we censor ourselves rather than forcing those with power and wealth to do it explicitly. And why did you specifically choose to talk about the energy industry? What kind of stories did you come away with that were compelling for you to write about? Right. I chose the energy industry and Wyoming, not because the energy industry is particularly evil or even evil at all in my mind. They're corporations, and corporations are amoral. They're not immoral. They have one duty. That duty is fiduciary to make money for their shareholders. It's the role of government to constrain that, the actions of corporations. And of course, corporations have an interest in being unregulated. In some ways, it's really up to the government. You know, in Wyoming, the stories focus on the energy industry and conservative politics. But that's because the energy industry holds the wealth and the conservatives hold the power. So there's nothing inherent about the energy industry, nothing inherent about conservatism that makes it particularly prone 
to censorship. Liberals are every bit as capable of censoring as are conservatives in every industry if it gains control and power and wealth in a place is capable of working through government. So it, it so happens in Wyoming that it plays out in this particular way with which we're all familiar. You know, 70% of our state revenues comes from oil, gas, and coal. Um, and so that's how it plays out here. At UC Berkeley, it plays out in a very, very different way. You give somebody power and wealth, and they're going to try to silence voices of dissent. How can the regular person who's maybe even working in the coal industry, losing their job, how can they understand this? How does this make a difference in their decision-making? What changes for them? Well, you know, we all have to make a decision in terms of speech, you know, when we speak and when we don't, and what the consequences of that speech would be. In terms of criticizing our employer, the consequences can be extremely harsh. So that worker in the coal industry who might find something that's unfair or unjust deeply problematical in a moral sense, they have to decide, right? Is this worth the, the possibility of losing my job? I have to support a family. Those are very, very difficult calls. And I wouldn't criticize anyone for not speaking out in terms of their calculation of what it's likely to cost them. I have a luxury, right? I'm a tenured faculty member and tenure protects me. At least that's the notion. But it also obligates me Tenure comes with a very, very, in my mind, a very heavy duty. And that's a duty to the people of Wyoming who have granted me this privilege. And that duty is to tell them the truth, to speak truth to power, using the safety and security that I have that many of them don't have. And that's why several of the stories in the book I can tell on behalf of others who, quite frankly, were very worried about telling those stories themselves. So did they ask to be anonymous? I tried to use as few anonymous sources as possible in the book. I think there are two or three. And in my estimation, what they had to say was important enough that concealing their identity in the face of potentially very severe consequences was worth the trade-off. Most of my sources are named, and, and so there's nothing really hidden going on. Whether they could easily have gone public, written the book, written the story, told the story, without some prompting, without some, some work with me. That's sort of doubtful. Give me an example of some of these stories that you worked with people on and yeah. what they brought to light that you can share. So one story, let me go off campus. I think that's, there's a couple good stories there. One of those stories is in Rollins, Wyoming. The director of the, of the Carbon County Higher Education Center, Dave Throgmorton, was very much opposed to a coal-to-gas plant um, that was being proposed by DKRW. DKRW are the four initials of the people who were going to develop that plant. They were all former Enron executives. Dave Throgmorton was very concerned. He wrote letters to the editor as, as a citizen. Well, there was pressure brought to bear on the um, county commissioners in Carbon County, and they wrote a letter to the Higher Education Board demanding that they either silence their director, David Throgmorton, or by implication, fire him. And so they basically said, um, this energy project is too important to us um, to allow him to speak freely. So that's a pretty clear connect the dots. Another case up in Casper. And this case begins at UCross, where UCross pulled together this fascinating photojournalistic project called the New Gold Rush that was revealing uh, the environmental impacts of a coal bed methane extraction. And so they showed that they had to show up at the Big Red Barn at UCross, and some people from the oil industry in Casper came to that show. And the show had been scheduled at that point. It was planned on the books to go down to the Nicolaisen. And under pressure from particular individuals in the book, they're named, from the oil and gas industry, that show was canceled at the Nicolaisen Art Museum. The public was not allowed to see those photographs. Um, there's not many steps. I mean, that's one of the advantages of writing that book in Wyoming. We're small, we're fairly transparent, and there are not that many dots to connect as there might be in California, Texas, or, or New York, for example. What kind of reaction have you gotten to your book? Not just from maybe oil and gas, but in the general public. I've presented this book and I've talked about this book in now, I think, six or seven Wyoming cities, towns. Mm -hmm. Gillette, Casper, Cheyenne, Tonight in Jackson. So I've shared the book pretty widely. And I've gotten very, very positive responses. I've also uh, received some 
very thoughtful, critical questions. I've been extraordinarily pleased with the level of respect even among those who disagree with me. We've treated each other quite decently in Wyoming. As a matter of fact, I I have a little piece on my blog about how good it feels to be in places where I know my stories aren't welcomed, but there's not animosity, there's not threats. There's questions, there's discussion, and oftentimes with um, a conversation, there's a kind of a convergence of understanding. And again, in part because I'm not going after conservatives, I'm not going after the energy industry, I'm going after censorship. And whether you're from the right or the left, conservative or liberal, the importance of free speech in a democracy, especially in Wyoming at this time, where we need ideas and we need voices to criticize the status quo, we've never needed free speech more. And I think people are are understanding that. So at the core of your book is the idea that it's free speech and it comes in all different kinds of forms and you have just targeted this one area where you've seen this problem. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. So what I know, and this was an interesting task in trying to sort of sell the book to a publisher, all these stories come from Wyoming. Now, I do, in each of the stories, draw in from other parts of the country. You know, there's the people who have methane in their water in Pennsylvania, right? And they're compensated for that damage, but only in exchange for a legally binding requirement that they never speak about the settlement. There's a famous case of a, of a faculty member at, in Oklahoma who was silenced because she dared draw connections between fracking and earthquakes and some very wealthy donors, uh, donor, in, pa- in fact, to the university um, implicitly, well, explicitly, let's just come out and say it, threatened that those who are working in that area ought to be fired. Same thing, story in Texas, story in New York. So, you know, the powerful and the wealthy, as I said before, will attempt to silence those who put at risk their power and wealth. Um, And it's up to us as citizens and up to our government to protect our speech so that we can progress in terms of a democracy. We can raise questions. We can engage in ideas. And without that, we just, you know, dig trenches deeper and deeper. Well, I think that's an age-old struggle right there. (laughs) And how do you hope this can make a difference? What outcomes do you want to see? Yeah, it's absolutely an age-old struggle. I mean, it goes back ancient times, right? I mean, iconoclasm, right, was the the, the destruction of religious icons. So Mm -hmm. we've been at this a long time. You know, I don't have any fantasies that, you know, my book or these stories are going to change the world. But I do believe in this notion of a tipping point. I believe, I mean, let me take the example, for instance, of the violence that we're now talking about against the black community. So first we had Ferguson, Missouri, and then we had Tamir Rice, and then we had, so we had all of these stories. Now, any one of those stories, like any one story in my book, is not going to make the difference, but it's the accumulation of the stories. It's being able to show one another that we can tell our stories, and these stories begin to accumulate, and now those stories of the young black men who have been so violently treated have begun a national discussion, a, a profound national discussion about our uh, our race relations. So these stories, you know, I I see them tying into a national conversation, a conversation that in one way is manifesting with a movement across the country now to develop an amendment to the Constitution that would make it such that corporations are no longer considered persons and money is not considered speech because that's what Citizens United did. And when corporations have the same rights as you and I have as individuals, and when money counts as speech, democracy is in big trouble. So I I see it as a grain of sand. I see it as adding to that scale, making connections in ways with implications that I can't even quite imagine. But every story, I think, contributes. Every book is a chapter in this narrative, in this long, as you point out, essentially unending struggle for liberty. That, for me, is really the reality of sort of being a, you know, kind of a political activist, right? Um, an activist for, for free speech in that we'll, we'll never be done. You know, we dream of this time where, you know, our work is completed, but that's never going to happen. I mean, that's the curse and blessing. The curse is the work will never be done. The blessing is there will always be good work to do. I mean, it's a little bit like, you know, good old Sisyphus shoving the boulder. All right. You know, <laughs> right. Albert Camus' famous essay about Sisyphus, right? He's got this, this line in there right toward the end where he says, we must imagine Sisyphus happy. <laughs> right? And so Sisyphus right. is the, the meaning 
can't be in, in his success. It can't be in him finally achieving, right, this glorious state, right, with the boulder at the top of the hill because it always rolls back down. Well, I think it's that way in terms of social justice. The boulder's always going to roll back down and we're always going to need somebody at the bottom to push it back up. In going around Wyoming and introducing your book and, and talking about it, do you feel like you've opened people's eyes? Do you feel like you've empowered someone? I think I have. I mean, some of the conversation, I remember one conversation in Gillette in particular with a young man. You know, he was pretty resistant to the stories of the book and, and whatnot. We went back and forth. And, and so one of the analogies, the metaphors I use in the book is the metaphor of the company town. All right. I don't know if you remember, you know, Tennessee Ernie Ford, 16 tons. I owe my soul to the company store. The hazard of the company town Right? It's not that the company is necessarily evil or bad. It's that we become so dependent on them that we can't criticize them, we can't doubt them, we can't question them, and we're terrified that they'll leave. Right? And I said, that's the core of why economic diversification is needed in Wyoming. All right? Because it's through that diversification that we begin to recapture our liberty. We are no longer afraid that the company will leave our town. Right. Of course, we don't want the energy industry to, to leave. We want them to stay and do a good, clean, responsible job. But we can't be de- that dependent for two-thirds, maybe 70% of our state revenue on a single industry. It's just not healthy. And it's not healthy, not because the energy industry is particularly evil. It's because no community is going to be healthy when it's that dependent on a single source of revenue. Mm-hmm. How great was it when they stopped the monopolization of the telephone companies? And talk about the importance of communication, right? I mean, imagine, you know, that was back, you know, when I was kind of a kid. You know, imagine today if communication was controlled by, you know, by a single entity. Well, I I think they're having that discussion. Oh, oh no, it's still going on. It's still going on, right? Um, You know, free access to the Internet and and who gets on. No, and that's, that's part of rolling that boulder. (laughs) <laughs> you know, that's right. That battle is never going to be over. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So true. Well, what kind of lasting thoughts do you want to leave with our audience to think about and and maybe just walk away with, so they can have something to chew on in terms of? Have you ever thought about ah uh, blank? Right. <laughs> right. I guess. I guess what I um. I guess the notion would be, have you ever stopped to think about what it is that you feel you can't say? You know, we, we tend to internalize that to such an extent. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then think about the next step, and this is the scary step. The things that you can't say at work, right? The next thing that happens are the thoughts that you can't have. You can't speak, and then you don't even have those thoughts. All right? So... Recover those thoughts, even if you can't speak about them. Don't allow yourself to stop thinking. Right. Stop. Don't allow yourself to stop learning and exploring. Or another way of putting that is think Wyoming. That's right, because that's at the core of everything we do is the why. It's the human experience. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I'm Emmy DeGrappa. This Think Why podcast is brought to you by the Wyoming Humanities. We use the humanities as a lens to explore the human experience. You can find us online at thinkwhy.org.